2.1 billion. That's a pretty big number. If you counted one number every second, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it would take you about 70 years to count to 2.1 billion. 2.1 billion people around the world claim the name of Jesus today. And 2.1 billion is just a fraction of the number of people who have followed Jesus for the last 2,000 years. But this worldwide family of believers began with only a small number of committed individuals who had an encounter with a power larger than themselves. That handful of people went from being faces in the crowd to active parts of a movement that would change the course of humanity forever. Through the Spirit of God, we have the potential for great things. Jesus has empowered each one of us to change the course of history. It's up to us to take on that challenge. The founders of the early church were not anything special on their own. They were ordinary people who encountered an extraordinary power and responded in obedience. That's their origin story. What's yours? I feel that um, God has impressed it upon my heart over the last couple of weeks to pray for dads uh, this morning. Uh, and you might be like, well, it's Father's Day. Of course, that's what you do is you pray for dads at church on Father's Day. But maybe um, we, could, we could just look at it a little bit differently. And we did some first service as well. But over the last several weeks in my own uh, personal life, I've walked alongside friends who uh, desire so badly to be fathers and they're going through fertility treatments that aren't working. Uh, I've walked alongside friends that have um, buried children in the last couple of years. Uh, I've walked alongside friends who have lost their dads. I've, I've walked alongside friends uh, who have grown children that are making really, really bad decisions. And I'm not saying like really bad decisions like you shouldn't be dating that girl, but really bad decisions like that's a substance that you shouldn't be putting in your body, that kind of bad decision. And so on a day like this, you know, I, I, you know I'm, I'm so grateful for my kids, and they are the greatest gift that God has ever given me. In fact, yesterday I was telling Kaya, uh, she's four, uh, that, that tomorrow is Father's Day, and it's a day where you honor your dad and love your dad, maybe give a gift to your dad. It's like a day set aside to celebrate dads. And she said, hmm, when's Grandma's Day? And I said, you're going to go live with someone else for a while. Like, that's, no, that's not what I said. That's not what I said. And so I, 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 I take a lot of joy and pride in, in my kids, for sure. But then I know that on this day, there's joy and pride, but there's also ache for some of us, right? There's ache for some of you who have lost your father, ache for some of you uh, that are dads. And maybe there are moments when you're not sure kind of quite how to parent your kids. You know you love them. You know you want the best for them. But there's wisdom that maybe you need there. And and so I just wanted to pray as we hold those two things in tension, this joy that God has given us and also this ache uh, together and, and kind of pray into that and then we will open up God's word together. Does that sound good to you? Okay, let's pray. God, thank you for the worship team and Andy as he led us this morning, especially in remembering that the only perfect dad is you. And so we look to you and declare that you are perfect in all of your ways, and yet we are imperfect. Your word says that if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And so there are men in this room, God, as we seek to be great dads to our kids, we need your wisdom because you are perfect and we are not. So we come to you for wisdom. God, we come to you for wisdom on how to parent that high school kid that has gone completely off the rails and we're not even sure what to do and they don't even want to talk to us anymore. God, we, we come to you for wisdom and how to parent that four-year-old or eight-year-old that's throwing fits and is bullying other kids at school. We don't know how to do it, and we need your wisdom. God, we come to you uh, for wisdom to parent that 22-year-old university student that's uh, promiscuous and has got drugs and alcohol happening and all that kind of stuff. God, uh, we were once sinners, and you sent your son for us, so teach us Oh, God, to be that kind of dad that goes after and pursues in a wise way, in a helpful way, in a constructive way. And God, um, give us wisdom. God, we pray for comfort for those in the room that uh, 
for them, this day might be a little bit hard. I know of, I know of multiple dads in our congregation that will um, leave the service, either the first service this morning or this service, and go visit the graves of their children. And so we pray that you would bring comfort like only you can, that you would bring a, a balm for that ache in their soul like only you can. Oh, Spirit of God, we can offer nothing to those families, to those individuals, but you can. And so we come to you. We plead with you. We beg you to bring comfort. And God, I was reminded even last week as uh, we took a look at a passage in our, our life group that that moment when the disciples come to you and you're asleep on the boat And they're panicked and they don't know what to do and they think they're gonna die and they think they're gonna be overcome and Mark tells us that the boat was threatening to sink. It had not sunk. It was not going to sink. It was only threatening to sink. So God, for the dads in this place that, um, that have aches, that have concerns, that have anxieties, all those things, would you remind us today that the boat is only threatening to sink, that you are in control and this is your show and your day and your life and your world and we Submit to you, a God who is good and who is in control. Most of all, oh God, I pray that the dads in this place would walk out not feeling ashamed or broken or I'm not doing enough, I'm not good enough, I should be more and more and more, but they would walk out knowing I'm giving my best to God and to my kids and that they would even feel a sense of honor from their children today and hope and even, even a sense of honor from you as you look on them and say, I, I'm so glad that you are my kid. For each dad in this place, oh God, we pray. Open our eyes and open our ears now to what you might have to say to us through your word and through church history. In Christ's name, the people of God said, amen. Uh, look up here on the screen. This picture here is of uh, an oak tree. It's called the Seven Sisters Oak, and it's in Manville, Tennessee. And you probably can't tell by the picture because there's nothing you know, to, to gauge how, how big it is. But this oak tree, uh, the trunk itself is 40 feet around. It's 70 feet high, and the crown of it from side to side is 140 feet. It's the largest known oak tree in the world. I, I can't believe that there would be an unknown oak tree that was this big. This oak tree in Mandeville, Tennessee, this is not a joke, is 1,500 years old. It is an absolute gargantuan monster of a tree. There is nothing that compares to it. And you might wonder to yourself, how does one get an oak tree that big? Like, like, like water and sun? Like, is that how that happens? Like, how do I tend my garden? I can't even grow tomatoes. These guys are growing oak trees. They're 1,500 years old. Okay, so this is what I want you to know this morning. Just get this in your head. Are you ready? This is a very, very simple truth. The mighty oak needs but an acorn. That's how that tree started, a seed about that big. And somebody planted it, or it got, you know, covered up by soil. There's a little water and a little sunlight, and it sprouted. And it grew a little bit, a little water and a little more sunlight, and it grew a little bit. And now it's 40 feet around at its base, and it's 140 feet wide at its crown, and it stands 70 feet tall, and it's 1,500 years old and counting, and it all started with a very small seed. The mighty oak needs but an acorn. As we talk about movements of revival in the church over the last uh, 2,000 years, which is what we're going to do today, I want you to know and I want you to compare those revivals to this oak tree in Tennessee. Uh, Matthew Henry, a Bible commentator, once said this, that when God intends a great mercy for his people, he sets them a praying. Let me, let me use our metaphor from this morning and kind of combine Matthew Henry's, comment, Matthew Henry's commentary here is that the acorn of prayer grows into the mighty oak of revival. This has been the case for 2,000 years of church history. 
the acorn of prayer, a very small seed that no one would have recognized or no one would have even known or expected to grow into something like that is the acorn of prayer. And when it gets water and sunlight, the acorn of prayer grows into the mighty oak of revival. Jesus would say it this way, consider the mustard seed. It's the smallest seed in all of first century Palestine. It's planted in a field, and when it grows, it becomes an enormous tree, and all of the birds of the air come and nest in its branches, now 2.1 billion and counting birds that are nesting in the mustard tree that is the kingdom of God. The mighty oak needs but an acorn, and that acorn is the acorn of prayer that grows into the oak tree of revival. When we say at Bayview Glen Church that by 2030, we'd like to see 6,000 disciples living in community together in life groups and serving on serve teams, we are talking about revival, men and women of God. Make no mistake, if by 2030, we actually see this vision come to fruition, we will stand back and say, only God could have done that. That's supernatural, that's wild. It will not come through ministry programs. It will not come through my preaching, praise God. It won't come through Alpha or life groups. It won't come through you know, your personal relationships with people. That all contributes, yes, that's the sun and the water and all that stuff, but the revival that we're looking for over the last 2,000 years has always begun with a teeny tiny acorn called prayer. Our sixth and final value is really what's at the foundation. It's at the core of this action of prayer. And our sixth and final value is this, that God can do it. God can do it. Remember, our values up to this point are Jesus first, everybody's somebody, we're better together, we're made new to renew, God gets our best, and now we believe as a church that God can do it. You think your marriage is on the rocks and it's irreparable? I beg to differ, God can do that. You think your financial situation is irreparable and you've just gone so far that nothing could ever correct that? I beg to differ, God can do that. You think this city is so far gone? You look around this city and what's happening in terms of, in terms of the brokenness and the mental illness issues and the moral decay and all those things? You think this city is too far gone? I would invite you to believe this today, that God can do it. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to pay attention, very close attention. There's not gonna be a quiz after this. You're not gonna need to know all these names and dates, but I'm gonna throw a lot of names and dates out at you in order to prove that God can do it. Because, because it's not that he just can do it, it's that he has done it. So for the last 2,000 years, when circumstances seemed the most dire, when the church had its back against the wall, when the church was about to be obliterated from the face of history, God intervened because of the acorn of prayer, and that acorn of prayer grew into a mighty oak tree called revival, and it has happened over and over and over again. And so to close the service this morning, we're going to sing, I've seen you move, you move the mountains, and I believe you can what? You can do it again. And so my prayer for you this morning is that you would walk out believing that God can do it and our natural response to that value is to get on our knees and ask him to. Prayer has been the seed for every great movement of God throughout the last 2,000 years. Let's take five examples. Consider the first century. The very first century, the people of God, after Jesus ascended into heaven, about 100 of them at the time, gathered in Jerusalem in the upper room. And when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, they were in one accord, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the Holy Spirit filled the disciples, and they were given the ability to speak a known language in order to share the gospel. And the Bible tells us that 5,000 converted to Christianity that very first Pentecost Sunday. Because they counted just men back then, it would have been closer to probably 13 or 14,000 that converted one time, one day, because the Holy Spirit descended on them and gave them power to do it. That, men and women of God, is revival. And you might be asking yourself, so where's the prayer part? Well, we understand that Acts, that's volume two of Luke's two volume set, right? Volume one is the book of Luke. Now, let's watch how the book of Luke ends, watch. 
And he led them out as far as Bethany. This is Jesus leading them, his disciples, out as far as Bethany. Lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. We call that the ascension. Forty days after Jesus resurrected from the dead, ascended into heaven. What did the disciples do? They worshipped him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple blessing God. They went to Jerusalem, and they began to worship and pray. And for 40 days, they continually blessed God and worshiped and prayed. So when the Holy Spirit descended on them, the Holy Spirit did not find them playing canasta. The Holy Spirit found them on their knees in prayer. Just a little bitty group of people, just a teeny tiny little acorn, and all they were doing was praying. And the next thing you know, revival broke out in Jerusalem and continues on today because 2.1 billion increases each and every day. You get that, don't you? And the birds of the air are coming to nest in this mustard tree or oak tree. You figure out which kind of tree you want them to nest in. And it began with the acorn of prayer. It did not begin with ministry programs. It certainly did not begin with Peter's great preaching. I mean, God used all those things, but it began with prayer. Fast forward to the 18th century, and look, I know we just fast forwarded through a lot of ground there, okay? But if you're like, man, what happened for those 1,700 years? Just go back and listen to the last five messages, all right? We'll catch you up to speed. In the 18th century, I'm not sure if you know this, but we look back and we think the United States and Canada, North America and Europe, you know, they were Puritans and they were all conservative and everybody kind of had it locked tight and everything was going really well. It was not. There was moral decay going on all across Western Europe and the world at the time. In the United States, there was a population of five million people, 300,000 of them were confirmed alcoholics. Bank robberies were a daily occurrence. It was the very first time in the history of the United States and Canada that women were afraid to go out alone at night for fear of their own lives. At the very same time this moral decay was happening, churches were in decline. Again, we think that everybody went to church back then. They didn't. Uh, The Methodist church was the largest denomination at the time, and during this time, they were losing more members than they were gaining. The Anglican church and the Episcopalian church were languishing so much, they actually considered joining together and making a new denomination. Listen, when Anglicans and Lutherans consider joining together, the situation is dire. You understand what I'm saying? There was a district superintendent, a bishop in in the church, in the Anglican church, that actually left his post because for 15 years they didn't welcome any new members into the church. He said, I'm just out of work went and found other work. I mean, churches were in decline. The Baptists, and this is an an exact quote from their general assembly, said, it's our most wintry season. This was during the time of the age of reason, the age of enlightenment, when people were jettisoning religion and spirituality for the sake of reason and logic, etc., And so many people from that outside culture, that age of reason, begin to speak out against the church and say things like this. John Marshall, who was a a, a district attorney in the United States, said the church is too far gone to ever be redeemed. Thomas Paine, one of these enlightenment thinkers, said that one good schoolmaster is of more worth than a hundred priests. I mean, he said this pejoratively, you understand. Voltaire, you may have heard of Voltaire, said Christianity will be forgotten in 30 years' time. And you might just think that that was people from outside culture. No, it was not. The great historian Kenneth Scott Latourette said that the church was so backed against the wall, it looked like it was about to be ushered out of the affairs of man forever. And here we are. None of that stuff happened. It's way past 30 years since Voltaire said this. What happened? The acorn of prayer. There was a Scotch-Irish pastor, a man named John Erskine. You've probably never heard of him before. He released a little pamphlet called Pleading with the People of Scotland and Elsewhere to Unite in Prayer for the Revival of Religion. Very teeny tiny little letter. Not that big a deal. But there was an American pastor in New England, and somebody gave him a copy of that book, and he read the book, and he published a response. His response, the title, is A Humble Attempt to Promote Explicit Agreement and Visible Union of God's People and Extraordinary Prayer for the Revival of Religion and Advancement of Christ's Kingdom on Earth Pursuant to Scripture Promises and Prophecies Concerning the Last Time. That is not the book itself. That's just the title. (laughs) You may not have heard of this book before, but it was published by a man named Jonathan Edwards. And when Jonathan Edwards and his church and John Erskine and his church began to take up the mantle of prayer, things began to change. Jonathan Edwards himself was not a brilliant orator. In fact, uh, if you would have listened to Jonathan Edwards preach, you would have, or heard or saw him preach, you would have seen him hold a pulpit and stand still and look down at his notes and preach like this the entire time. 
you are sinners in the hands of an angry God. That's actually one of his sermon titles, by the way. Aren't you glad I don't do that one, right? (laughs) And people were converting to Christianity en masse. Like, who comes out to see that guy? His church was filled to the brim. People standing out on the patio and on the porch just trying to hear the gospel, the good news about Jesus. Why? Because the acorn of prayer began to grow into the mighty oak called revival. The revival didn't just stay in the U.S., by the way. At the very same time, a man named John Wesley was riding his horse all over the British Empire and the United Kingdom at the time and preaching in outdoor festivals and outdoor gatherings. And anybody who would come and listen to John Wesley preach, he's the founder of the Methodist movement. Long before it was popular, he began to preach out against the ills of slavery and preach in, uh, for the abolition of slavery. And people were converting, again, en masse to Christianity. George Whitfield, who had a time tiny little squeaky voice like, Mouse, George Whitfield, kind of speak like this. They didn't have audio back then. That's just what it was written about him, okay? It was the middle of the 18th century. And people would come out to these open air gatherings, 10, 12, 15,000 at a time, and convert to Christianity. And the world began to change because of the acorn of prayer. So much so that Benjamin Franklin, who is not a Christian at all, once described the first great awakening, that's what this whole revival got named, the first great awakening, as wonderful. A change soon made in the manners of our inhabitants from being thoughtless or indifferent about religion. It seemed as if all the world were growing religious so that one could not walk through the town in the evening without hearing psalms sung in different families of every street. The acorn of prayer grew into the mighty oak of revival. Fast forward to the end of the 18th century Uh, conditions deteriorated once again. There was spiritual apathy at universities all over the U.S. and Canada. A poll at Harvard uh, rendered up the number zero for amount of Christians on that campus. Princeton, which was a much more conservative and evangelical institution back then, only had two Christians on their campus. Dartmouth held an anti-Christian play. Williams College pulled a Bible out of a city hall and burned it in a public bonfire. Uh, Universities all over the U.S. and Canada and Great Britain were holding mock communion services in order to mock Jesus and mock Christianity. Can I just kind of stop right here real quick? So we talked about moral decay in our society, talking about spiritual apathy in universities. Does any of this sound familiar? Good. I don't have to make that connection for you. I'm hoping you're making that connection on your own. In addition, there was persecution going on such that Christians at universities, the little group that they were, had to meet in secret and not publish their name because they were so afraid for what might happen to them. The United States, Canada, and Great Britain were in the same boat once again. And then Isaac Bacchus, who you once again may not have heard of, planted this little acorn of prayer. And he published a plea for prayer, a memorial, he called it, to all the denominations and churches all across U.S., Canada, and Great Britain. And those denominations began to take up this plea for prayer and gather together on Monday evenings just to seek the Lord for revival. And the second great awakening broke out. The second great great awakening was absolutely spectacular in terms of people converting to Christianity. Just want to give you a couple statistics just so you know. Uh, um, A man named James McGreedy was um, a pastor in Ireland at the time, and he said that winter of 1799 was, for the most part, weeping and mourning with the people of God. This is how his church was. If anybody asks me, like, how's Bayview Glen doing? Uh, We weep and mourn a lot. I mean, that's like, that's, 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 that's not the nature of Christianity now or even the nature of our church. God's doing some great things, right? But back then, McGrady was like, man, this was just weeping and mourning. The church is languishing. We're losing members. There's less than 50 of us. That was the winter of 1799. By the summer of 1800, there were 11,000 people at his church. Six months. From the Second Great Awakening, you get the abolition of slavery because people like William Wilberforce and John Newton began to speak out, public education and global mission societies as a result of the Second Great Awakening. And that oak of revival started with what? The acorn of prayer. Fast forward to the middle of the 19th century. I'm going to call this a nation divided because the nation itself in the United States specifically was divided over the issue of what? 
slavery in the middle of the 19th century. And there was economic decline and there was moral decline and skirmishes had started to rise up between people in the North and South who weren't in full-fledged war yet, but there was rumblings of that and things were dire and it seemed bleak and people thought the church was dead. So Jeremiah Lamphere, who was a pastor at a Dutch Reformed church in Manhattan, published an article in the, in the, in the Manhattan Tribune and invited as many people as wanted to come to pray. Out of a million people in New York at the time, a million people, six showed up. But they prayed. They prayed. And the next week, the Bank of Philadelphia collapsed. So that next Monday, they had 40 folks. And they prayed with 40 for a few weeks. And then on October 10th, the stock market collapsed. And then they had about 10,000 praying. And revival broke out. Trinity Episcopal Church there in Manhattan, or in Chicago, Illinois, actually. uh, This was normal for, I just want to show you one statistic. This was normal for churches. Uh, In 1857, Trinity Episcopal Church had 121 members. By 1860, they had 1,400 members. Look at the percentages there. Of 30 million people in the United States at that time, a population of 30 million, next slide, a population of 30 million, over 1 million converted to Christianity in those five years during the Third Great Awakening. One of those individuals was a young man named Albert. Albert converted to Christianity and got a call to the pastorate. He took his very first church at age 21 in Hamilton, Ontario, believe it or not. He was there for a couple years. He moved to Louisville, pastored a church there for a little while, moved back to New York, pastored a church there for a little while, and then decided because he was motivated by that deep sense of purpose and Christ's transformative work in his heart, Albert began to call other denominations to work with him. That Albert is a man named A.B. Simpson who founded the Christian and Missionary Alliance. There's over 500,000 members of that church in the U.S. alone. There are churches all over Canada, including this one that call ourselves a family of churches that work together for the sake of the gospel. Missions work going on in the least reached people groups all over the world. Because because A.B. Simpson had a good idea? Because Dwight Moody, who also converted during the Third Great Awakening, had a nice idea? No. It's because Jeremiah Lamphere and six people in an old Manhattan warehouse gathered and began to pray. Fast forward to the early 20th century. This is the early 1900s. And things were not good again. And so the people of God began to call on God for prayer. Uh, There was a young man named Evan Roberts who was at school in Ireland. And at a university prayer meeting one day, he prayed this simple prayer, Oh God, bend me. It's a very bold prayer. Oh God, bend me. What he felt God called him to do was return to his hometown. Once again, he was at university at the time. Return to his hometown and preach to the youth there in his hometown about prayer and revival. So he went to the president of his school and he said, can I have a week off to go home and preach to the youth about prayer? And he said, I feel that God is calling me. And he said, "Uh, are you sure it's God calling you? And he said, no other voice would tell me to do this. So the president of his university said, all right, you get a week off. So he took a week off. He went back to his hometown and he asked his pastor, you know, somebody like me, can I preach on Sunday morning? And his pastor said exactly what I would say, no. And he said, well, what about the prayer meeting tonight? And he said, I'll tell you what, you come to the prayer meeting tonight and I'll ask if anybody wants to stay over and maybe they'll listen to you. About 100 people were at that prayer meeting that night and Evan Roberts uh, stuck around afterwards to share and six people stuck around. And he said, God is calling us to united and concerted prayer. He's calling us to confess any known sin to to obey the Spirit promptly, to publicly defend our faith in Christ or declare our faith in Christ. And so those six or seven people in that church began to pray. The next night, Evan Roberts preached again, and then again on Wednesday night at the Bible study. He stayed there not just for a week of preaching, but for two weeks of preaching. And more and more people came to hear him preach and to pray, to hear him preach and pray, and then revival broke. And when I say revival broke, I mean revival. I mean you couldn't get a seat in these churches. I mean prayer meetings ending at 4, 4 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. People would pray all night, and then they would go, we want to stick around and just pray more. It's called the Welsh Revival, and it didn't stop there. It spread all across Great Britain and all throughout uh, the U.S. and Canada, and people were converting to Christianity 
en masse. As a matter of fact, it changed social, social situations and public situations as well. So many people were converting to Christianity that there was a, there was a slowdown of work at the mines. How can it be a slowdown of work at the mines? It's because a bunch of miners converted, and they were using a bit of salty language before, right? A bit of salty language. Does everybody know what that means? Okay, good. A bit of salty language before to order around their donkeys. And then when they converted to Christianity, they stopped using that salty language, and the donkeys couldn't understand them anymore. <laughs> Took them a few weeks to teach them the language of the Spirit, you know what I mean? Get them back to work again. Uh, during the Welsh Revival and the Fourth Great Awakening, there was just a string of bankruptcies all across Great Britain and the U.S., most of them taverns. The, 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 the birth of children outside of wedlock dropped by 50%. As a result of that Great Awakening, just Evan Roberts and a few people praying in Wales, in Wales, 25% of Yale students at that time were enrolled in prayer meetings. I bet if you went to Yale today, you probably wouldn't find that percentage, don't you think? Uh, of 50,000 inhabitants in Atlantic City, the pastors confirmed there that there were 50 yet unconverted of 50,000. In Portland, Oregon, which is uh, widely known as a liberal city in the US now, there are about 250 downtown businesses that all came to an agreement together that they were gonna shut down from 11 o'clock to 2 p or 2, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. every day so they could focus on prayer. And they all did it so there would be no competition, just so they could pray. I mean, things went all over the country, all over the world, and it spread to Chile and Argentina and Africa, these great awakenings, these revivals that began with the acorn of prayer spread all over. And look, in Great Britain, during the fourth great awakening, the police didn't have anything else to do. People just stopped committing crimes. So they went to the sergeant of the police station. This is recorded, it's in a newspaper. Sergeant of the police station there in a town in Great Britain. He's like, what, do you, what did you do before the revival broke out? Well, we were here to prevent crime and control crowds, like at soccer games, football games, right? So now there's no more crime, so we don't have that to do. And the only place that we have to control crowds is at church, because that's where everybody is. They said, you go to church? And they said, yeah, we go to church regularly. So how does that work? Well, we have 17 policemen at our station. That means we have four quartets. So anytime the church needs some music, they just call the police. And we send over one of our quartets. Somebody walked around Great Britain on a Monday night um, just in one single town for an hour and found over 6,000 people in prayer. Men and women, these, these great awakenings, these four, and even this revival and act, these things change the world. They change society. They change cities. And we talk about that uh, like revival, and we talk about, oh, God, change our city. Oh, God, change our family. Oh, God, change our country. Oh, God, change the world. Listen, it's not that big a dream. You know why? Because God can do it. Not only, not only can he do it, he has done it. He's got a little bit of a track record here. Right? It's not somebody who just graduated university and they taught me how to do all this stuff in university. It's somebody that comes to you and goes, look, not only did I, do I know this, but I've demonstrated my ability to do it over time. He has done it again and again and again. And that mighty oak that is revival every single time started with a teeny tiny acorn of prayer. It simply comes down to this oft-quoted verse, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray, Seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. You gotta do three things. Humble ourselves. Pray. Seek the face of God. And his promise is this. Or turn, and turn from our wicked ways, sorry. His promise is this, that we'll hear from him, that he'll forgive our sin and heal our land. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when we say this together as a church, that by 2030, Bayview Glen Church endeavors to be a family of 6,000 disciples with 3,000 in life groups and 3,000 on serve teams. And that's what we believe, that's what we're shooting for, that's our big, hairy, audacious goal. We want you to know, and we want the world to know, that we can't do it. <laughs> no way. No preaching, no programs, no really great music, although music was really great. That doesn't change lives. 
It's the Spirit of God that changes lives. It's the Spirit of God that initiates revival. It's the Spirit of God that sets his people a praying when he wants to extend to them great mercies, like the great mercy of revival. It's the acorn of prayer that grows into that mighty oak. So we're gonna do two things. One is kind of a a broader thing from Bayview Glen Church and then also uh, right here specifically in this service. The first thing that I wanna tell you is that um, I've not been great at this personally. Uh, Personally and as your pastor, I've not done a great job leading us to be a prayerful church. So I'm gonna work on it. Um, I'm gonna try. I'm not always good, I'm not always perfect. I miss things all the time. But I'm gonna try. And so next week, uh, we're gonna review the last five or six weeks of content, all of our mission and our vision and our values. Mission, we work together so that everyone everywhere can experience God's love and his created purpose through Jesus. Vision is by 2030, we desire to be a family of 6,000 disciples with 3,000 in life group, 3,000 on serve teams. And our values are Jesus first, everybody's somebody. We're better together, we're made new to renew. God gets our best and God can do it. And so next week as we review, and for some of you, you're like, man, I've been to all these sermons. I'm just going to take next Sunday off and go to brunch. Don't. There will be new content. I promise. Okay. There'll be some new content. And for those of you who missed a couple, a couple I'm going to give you the Coles notes. And we are going to pause throughout the service, throughout the sermon next week to pray, to pray for revival in our city, to pray for revival in our homes. We're going to seek the face of God. Uh, the second thing is, uh, throughout July and August, uh, on Sunday morning, we're going to introduce you digitally to all of our international workers that we support through Bayview Glen Church, one at a time, and we're going to take time to pray for them. Because the seed of revival in their cities, in North Africa, and in Uganda, and, and all over the world, the revival that might happen there begins with the acorn of prayer, and we're going to be a part of that acorn. We're going to pray. Here's the wild part. I'll say this one last thing. I didn't, I didn't say this to the first service for obvious reasons. The reasons that will become obvious here in a minute. And then we're gonna pray. I preach the message in the first service. I go upstairs and the guy who's running the pro presenter is a, is a friend and part of our serve team here. And he goes, Lucas, you, you wouldn't believe this. This is what's wild. He said, a week ago I was praying and God uh, put a prayer on my heart to pray for a fresh outpouring of his spirit. And, and not just for my group of friends and not just for me and not just for our church, but for Canada. God, pour your spirit on Canada. God, send your spirit to Canada. And he goes, it was a big prayer. It was a big goal. And and throughout the week, he said, I was hearing sermons and God was continuing to prompt me to fast and pray for revival and fast and pray for revival. And here you are talking about this very value that God can do it. And so we're gonna seek him in prayer and ask that he will. I, I want you to know, men and women, that these movements of prayer didn't start with clergy. I mean, these were pockets of people, you and me, just, you know, gathering together to pray. And it seems as if to me within Bayview Glen Church and even within our city, there is a movement of God to begin to stir up for himself, collect for himself a group of folks committed to prayer to be that acorn that he might grow into the oak tree that is revival so that all the birds of the air might come and nest in its branches. So as a people this morning, with just a couple minutes that we have remaining, we are going to humble ourselves and pray, turn from our wicked ways, and ask that God would heal our land. Would you pray with me? So God, maybe I could just back up one step as I begin to pray here. For some of us, we want revival. We long for spiritual renewal. We long for your Holy Spirit to do the work that only you can do. We see the brokenness in our city. We see the aches and pains. We see places where the gospel can be the only cure for disease. And so we long, God, with all of our hearts and our souls and our guts, we long to see revival in this day and age. For some of us, it's a back up one step. And so we ask God, when we don't desire it, would you cause us to? Just as a way of confession, as a matter of confession, sometimes God is, we don't want to want it, so give us the want. (laughs) We don't want to pray, so give us the want to pray. We don't necessarily desire mass revival, God, so would you stir up in the hearts of your people a desire to see a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit. God, stir up within us hearts of prayer. Stir up within us 
um, a desire to be on our knees before you and calling out to you and believing, God, that you can do it. It seems impossible to us. It seems improbable to us. But you have demonstrated, God, over and over again that you can do it. So cause us to be people of prayer. God, as Evan Roberts once um, exhorted the church to confess their sin, God, we confess that we have been prayerless at times. God, we have confess, we confess that we've walked away from you at times. God, we confess that we've been silent when given the opportunity to share the good news about you. God, there have been times where we have dropped the ball, and so we are so grateful, God, for your forgiveness in those days, places and times, and we're also so grateful that it doesn't depend on us. We can't do it, but you can do it, God. You can bring healing and hope to a marriage that needs revival. You can bring healing and hope to mental health that needs new life. You can bring healing and hope to loneliness. You can bring healing and hope to disillusionment and spiritual apathy. God, you can do it. And so we pray, oh God, for a fresh wind of your spirit that you would set us on fire, God, for you. Give us boldness, oh God. Just as the early believers prayed for boldness, we pray for boldness. We're thankful, God, in every situation just as you instructed us to do. We come to you and ask for wisdom just as you instructed us to do. God, we come to you in prayer. And with all our hearts, oh God, we ask for revival. Make us a church that believes, God, that you can do it. These big visions, these big dreams we have, we'll dream big, we'll plan big, because we believe you can do it. But that mighty oak, God, always begins with an acorn of prayer. So may we be a people that starts there. In the name of Christ, the people of God, together said, amen.